Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Jude Morris Foundation. We are going live with our mind and body coaching. Without further ado, let me introduce our panel. So first up, I'm joined by Kay. Secondly, Hi. I'm joined by Yanis from Olympus Hello. Pro. And last, but absolutely by no means least, uh, Mr. Carlton Husband from Phoenix Evenstroke Kawasaki. So um, let me get the panel to introduce themselves. Firstly, ladies first, Kay. <laughs> hey, Mark. Hey, everyone. So I'm Kay Wilburn from Gritty People Athletes. And um, I'm just here to really share a little bit on mindset and mental preparation for the race season, which we discussed earlier on is four weeks today. Um, so it's definitely time to start talking about how to get your mind ready. Brilliant. And uh, let's go to you next, Yanis. Hello. Uh, yes, um, I'm Yanis. Uh, I'm, I'm a performance coach uh, and specialize in strength and conditioning and uh, injury rehabilitation. Uh, I'm working uh, specifically with motocross athletes and mountain bikers as well. And uh, yeah, uh, today we're going to discuss uh, mainly how to get ready for the first round and for the for, for the actual championship, actually, uh, Mexican National and British Championship. And as I say, last but certainly by no means least, I'm delighted that Carlton has joined us. Carlton Husband. Hi. Hi, everyone. So my name's Carlton Husband. I ride for Phoenix Even Strokes Kawasaki. Uh, currently doing the British MX2, uh, Pro MX2. So, yeah. Um, as we said off air, scarily, when I counted this up, we are four weeks away from Cullum. Yeah, so this true. weekend, it's four weeks until uh, everybody goes behind the gate at Cullum. Now, lots of people, we assume we've had a good winter and they were, you know, winter training. Um, Yanis, from your perspective in terms of being a performance coach, you know, where should the athletes be at this point? You know, um, wh where, where should they be in terms of their training? What should their training regimes be? So, um, by now, they should be actually pretty much finishing the off-season cycle, which is basically um, pretty much feel 100% confident regarding their, their strength and fitness. Um, with the boys, for example, what we're doing, we already basically have done the testing and compare the results from the off season. So make sure that uh, there's no any uh, any issues with their strength, with the fitness, with the fitness, or if they have any any previous injuries that they they they, they gone by now and they're, they're absolutely ready to to compete pretty much. Um, so if you would ask me where exactly should be now, they should prepare now to get into the phase of, as we call it, like a maintenance phase, where basically they maintain the gains that they've done all this off season and they're pretty much ready to be full on on the bike. So now they should focus more on the actual bike fitness and be ready basically to compete pretty much. Yeah. So Carlton, in, in, in terms of you, as I said, are you at Hawkstone this weekend? You're not, are you? Uh, no, no, unfortunately not this weekend, no. So talk, talk, talk us through where you are at the moment. I see you're doing a lot of training with Sam, but talk us through sort of your weekly training regime, uh, off the bike, if you don't mind. Yeah, so off the bike, um, obviously we ride Saturday, Sunday, every Saturday or Sunday. Um, Monday for us is kind of a recovery day, um, cycle, like stretching, all the rest of that, and a bit of a family day as well with being busy in the week and weekend. I like to spend the day with the family on a on a Monday and and still do the recovery, obviously. Um, but Tuesday we we do is a lower body, lower body on a Tuesday, and I'll do say me bike maintenance, say ever, anything that I've got to do, like say chains, sprockets, tires, all the rest of that kind keeping of stuff. Keeping it real, right? Yeah, keeping it real. Not 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 quite factory yet, are we? Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, just, just that kind of stuff. Get, get the bike ready for the Wednesday, and yeah, ride again Wednesday. Cycle on on Wednesday night if we're if we're close to home, if it's not too far away. Get a cycle and recovery done on Wednesday as well. Same for for Thursday. We normally try and ride two days in the week and the weekend. So, and yeah, we do it all again on. See, ride Wednesday, Thursday. Um, get the bike ready again on Friday, and try and do a upper body session as well on the Friday. And then, yeah, go again riding on the weekend at the minute. Okay, four, four weeks away. Um, 
a lot of people will be in the gym, they'll be exercising, they'll be riding a lot. But in terms of their mental preparation, you know, to me, it's a really, really important aspect of, of, of a rider. You know, what should the rider be doing at this stage of the season to get ready for that? Because when that gate drops, the first race, you know, Carlton will tell you, it's like a red mist because people haven't raced for, you know, for, for the winter. So what do people need to be doing to get that mind ready to race? I think, you know, it's a really good point, what you just said, like that red mist and that build up. So first race of the season, you know, people probably left the end of last season, maybe, I, I don't know, because I can't speak for every rider, but feeling a bit fatigued, you know, you've been doing it, like you say, depending on the championship you're doing, it's week on week on week. And at that point, the best thing to do mentally is just stop. Um, so hopefully some people have done that, they've stopped and then built up the regime again in terms of technical and physical training. Um, so yeah what do you do then four weeks out and, and and what i'm about to say might be a strange thing it might seem strange but actually getting too excited burns a lot of energy just in the same way as stress does mm -hmm. so the the chemical being released into you from your brain into your body and, and running us through you neurologically is still going to end up with fatigue so i think four weeks out i think thinking about that and managing that um emotional range that you're in so not getting I know, I know that's like, you know, we want to be pumped on the gate, but we also want to manage that emotional range so we're not excited to the point that we're, we're, we're using too much energy. Um, so, yeah, I'd definitely say one of those is one of those things. Trying to keep yourself a bit neutral. But also the other thing is four weeks out, four to six weeks out, is a really good time to start um, working on your nervous system. And... I've got to be honest, probably a lot of the things we talk about tonight, somewhere or another, is going to come back to our nervous system and how to manage that, like turning things on and off at will. Um, motocross in particular is a sport that, as, the, as anyone who rides motocross knows, is a high adrenaline sport. So because of that, you're releasing more cortisol into your body than most other sports actually uh, and I work with people across lots, uh, athletes across lots of different disciplines so you know cortisol is for anyone who hasn't heard that word before especially if there's anyone younger listening do you know when you feel a little bit stressed or you get angry or frustrated or you know that there's a, a chemical called cortisol and that gets released into your brain um, which is good sometimes but if you release too much of it into your body um it can it can actually damage your nervous system actually you know if, if you, you release too much so about four weeks out a really smart thing to do is start to learn how to switch cortisol on and off um and one of the things that um will help with that is um things like um attention training so I don't know, I don't know, Mark, if you, Carlton, Yanis, if you've ed ever done attention training, like body scan training. Who have you I done it? No. No. So About stay oh, present. Yeah. Stay, stay stay present, basically. Stay in the moment. Like, yeah. 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 And it's about staying present, but it's and, and by staying present, what you're actually doing is just training your brain to be able to switch off and on at will. So, you know, you can do things like body scans where you're taking your attention all the way through your body. Um, and when people are off the bike thinking like, why have I got my eyes closed for eight minutes? Like taking my attention through my body to do a body scan. Um, and you can do some great apps out there that you can use to do this type of stuff. Um, but you're actually creating habits so that your body knows how to turn off that cortisol, if, if that makes sense. Because you, you're training your brain to connect with your body um, in a way that you want it to so that you can relax. Um, so I guess that's just one of the things that, that you could start to do. Um, and you know when, when you're into kind of a sport that's very high adrenaline that can feel quite alien to do nothing and the idea that to do nothing will help you during a race um but it does because it, it's helping you regulate your nervous system so yeah that would be one thing of many that you could start to do four weeks out that's really interesting um Colton, beforehand we were talking about you know in terms of your preparation you said you know you're in a really good place um, you know, f physically, you feel great. 
it, when, you, when you're riding, it's easy to see where you are. You can do lap times. It's very simple. You can time yourself against other people. So you know kind of where you are in terms of your on-bike speed. But how do you assess where you are in terms of your fitness? And that's probably a question for you as well, Yanis. Is it, is it BPM? Is it body fat? Is it all of those things? Is it simply being able to do a 25-minute moto and not keeling over at the end of it? How, how do you judge where you are in terms of your, your, your fitness? Yeah, so we do a lot of things with the the heart rate monitor, um, especially this time of year. We, we everything every training session that we do, we have a heart rate monitor on, and as well this year we've done a is it the VO two max test? VO two max, yeah, yeah. We we done that, and the data that that gives you is crazy. Like where where you, I, I'm not very good at explaining it. Yanis will explain it a bit better, but where your heart rate's good and where it needs a bit of work and yeah so i, I think Yanis, did i did i have to work it a, bit, a little bit better in zone four or something i can't remember can you can you so um should, should i speak about the view to max specifically or would you like to know to, to discuss to describe basically what we're doing exactly what, what would you like mark to to know yeah i mean this I, I i think probably exp expand on what carlton was saying there but also so, in, in general how, how can you know if the people that are watching how can they test their fitness yeah so all right so if you have a coach normally the coach will do this for you anyway for people that don't have a coach they, they train on their own um there's you shouldn't over, over complicate it. So the, the easiest way I would say for now to um, how to, to to test yourself is first of all you should test your, in order to in order to make make the test worth thing you should test yourself before like in, during the off season and then after again so at least you have basically comparison so you know exactly what you're doing. If you're doing it, if you're doing only right now, it, you're just creating a, a baseline that can help you next season but otherwise it won't it won't make any any massive difference uh, testing wise now testing wise what you should test you should test your mobility and your flexibility which is very very neglected and any sport not just in motocross um a lot of injuries that we see uh, very often is is literally because the body could be strong but it's tight as a brick so when you crash you, your body most of the time goes in a funny positions and if you don't have the, the the right range of motion through the joints, you either can dislocate shoulders, for example, or you can pull a tendon, and and then pretty much that's it. You could be out for one, two races, and then you lose the championship as well. So flexibility, and mobility is something that you need definitely to make sure that, that you do uh, while you're testing. Then you have to test your strength, so you make sure that your yeah, strength levels, basically upper body and lower body, uh, are in in again in in a good place. How do you know it's a good place? You don't unless you can compare with somebody else uh that's why you it's good to, to do off season and then you can compare yourself again pre-season and then you know if you have any improvements um don't in my opinion don't try to do like don't try to do this strength test basically in uh, uh, isolation so like for example for biceps we don't use biceps in motocross do compound movements big movements because that's how the body works anyway in a more functional way and then fitness wise um it really depends the athlete as well and depends the coach personally i, I can say I, what i'm doing with with, with all the boys uh, train them in in person um we do an ftp test so 20 minutes basically which i take them through the uh, functional functional threshold and then we do not just vo2 max um in order to find basically the aerobic anaerobic threshold and the vo2 max as well so Calden, what you said before is like obviously like he's actually in a, in a in a great level. He's superior, so it's the highest you can get. But there's always room for improvement. So for him, for example, we, we had to work more on his aerobic um, capacity, and so the ability basically of burning more fats than carbs, because that way he can last for longer before he actually start gassing out. Um, which I, I believe he's doing really great. We didn't have any problem in Spain as well um and yeah that, that's that's what we're doing and then we're doing a few other things as well we compare we, if he has any injuries or if he had any injuries in the past we just make sure that th there's no any more any needles pains or anything that would actually stop him during the season and if he has any problems as well um like any any massive discrepancy on, on uh, left and right side either this is arms or legs 
that what we're trying to do is make sure that we balance it to a certain degree. We don't want to, to try to perfect anything because sometimes when you're trying to perfect something, you actually break something else. So it needs to be everything within a fine line, if that makes sense. And this is between me and the individual working with feedback, how you feel, where, you, where you're at this, at this stage. That's it. <laughs> okay, no, thank you for that. I think, uh, just to pick up on something Carlton said there, he talked about sort of weekly routines and, and just to link back into what Kay said about sometimes doing nothing is great. Um, mm -hmm. how, how important is it? You know, I mean, Carlton, you're riding four times a week, right? You, you're training, you know, to make sure you're recovering. You know, right, riding three 20 minute motors or 25 minute motors around Cuss's Gorse burns a lot of energy. You know, so yeah. how, how important is it to make sure that you are getting the rest and recovery you need in terms of your body and, of course, and your mind? Yeah, I think it's just as important as riding itself, isn't it? Like, you, if you, if you don't do the recovery and you, you kind of cut corners, you, you come to ride again the next day and, I don't know, you may be just not quite switched on so much or something like that, and, and you end up hurting yourself or, yeah. So you motor day then, Carlton, you, you, you go to Ironworks or wherever and, you know, you're chasing Sam round or Sam's chasing you round. He, he says he's going to beat you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, do you, yeah. what do you do? So you put the bikes away. What's recovery after that? Yeah, so home, go, make sure you have some good food. Um, and, yeah, it, it just a good stretch, a full body stretch, foam rolling every, every, after every ride. And yeah, just get ready again for the for the next time, you know, a real good stretch. And and Kay, in terms of sort of like the mental aspects, is is that it? You just switch off, get some sleep. I think it's a, it's like I said before, it's a lot easier said than done to stop. I think the other thing that's really important um, for younger riders, uh, older riders, it really doesn't matter. Is I think from from a, from a sport point of view, for an athlete and Colton, it'd be interesting to get your view on this as well. For an athlete, it can be really easy, especially during race season, to get really consumed, too too obsessed almost, and think that just to have to think about motocross all of the time, and a bit like well, exactly like the importance of resting your body. Your brain is a muscle. And in the same way that your brain is a muscle, or your body's that got muscle, your brain is a muscle. So it absolutely needs that switch off time to be able to download all the information. So let's say you've done some technical training or you've done a race, um, going and doing something else. So whether that's going out with friends, whether it's reading, whether it's um, just something you enjoy doing that's nothing to do with, with your sport, it reminds you that you're a person outside of motocross as well and outside of your sport, but it also gives you yeah. opportunity to download what you've learned and actually it like quadruples the impact of what you've learned so that when, and like Colton said, like you go out and race again, you know, you've got all this fresh data, you've had this reflection. Um, Colton, I mean, you, you know, you're a family man, you've got a child, you do take time out. What, what do you find with that? Yeah, definitely. I think it, it helps so much. Like if I was doing this seven days a week, you'd, you'd soon get sick of it and it kind of gets a bit repetitive, doesn't it? it that time away makes you like hungry, makes you, like you say, digest it all and ready to go again, definitely. Yeah, and, and I think that's the, the, the thing that's so, so super important, that that hunger. Um, the amount of athletes that I work with and they, they might say, you know, I'm losing my mojo, I've lost my mojo and I can't be bothered. And I would say 98% of the time it comes back to the fact that they're just overdoing it mentally and physically. Um, yeah. And they just have time out. So, yeah. It's, it's, not nothing, it's doing something else, nourishing for your brain as well. Not, not um, just I just pulled in a question from the screen. There's an excellent question from Ashton166. Um, does racing in the winter help with your mind and stop you getting overexcited and nervous through the summer? I know a lot of the younger riders are doing like Tom Arnold series and – you know, there's various winter seasons that yeah. go on. So is, is that a good thing, Kay? It's quite intense, you know. I mean, a lot, a lot of the guys are sort of, you know, going into Spain, working on technique. Uh, you know, a lot of the younger guys are doing the winter series. So what's, what's your advice around that? I mean, certainly from you, Carlton, but also from you as well, Kay. Do you want to go first, Carlton? Do you want me to? We were both out yeah, the same time, I think. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go. You go. So, I think you're saying ladies first. Mm -hmm. yeah, 
I, I think so. I think the answer is quite broad, um, really, because it depends on the individual. It depends on um, the environment at home. It depends on their environment in terms of uh, the intent, the capacity for intensity in the sport. You know, so I say this broadly. Um, I think the pros, you know, the, the, the the positives of doing it is that it does maintain that recency within the mind. Um, and therefore it improves confidence because you are practicing consistently without throughout the season. So I think that's a, a big plus to it. Um, I think one of the things that's important, and I suppose this isn't just because of the, um, you know, the winter series uh, part of this or, or doing your pre-season in Spain, is being, um, how can I put it, reducing your own intensity. So, you know, expectation is a really big thing isn't it so if you spend the whole of the winter thinking i've got to be number one i've got to be the best i've got to do that and then you start the season and you've already been at that very high state of alert and high expectation that could be a negative like a downside to it if that makes sense so yeah. i think pre-season spain um doing the winter series aston is it aston uh, yeah, all yeah. fantastic but all caveated with the you know the the expectation being i'm doing this to have fun i'm doing this to keep my confidence in a good place i'm doing this to stay fit and so you take away the pressure that you may otherwise put on yourself in that way it can be really nourishing for your brain to keep doing it uh, if you don't feel that you can do that then i would say don't do it over winter you know don't don't do them two series is is my honest um view on that and opinion um so yeah and i guess that would be different for every rider can i can i add something on that one as well yeah, um, please. um i would say to Aston to, and to every Aston because this is this is something very very common um a hundred percent i agree with with uh with kay and, and with uh calden as well but um the one thing that people don't realize is that definitely should do some races if you can and if you feel that way uh however just it's a, it's a fine line between overdo it and as Kay said as well you can come to the in season and burn yourself out very quickly but also you need to consider that a lot of riders um and i've seen that in the past during the season they just pick wild card uh, wild card race as well or they're doing two three championships basically so before you even realize you might have one or two main championships that you might follow but then you're doing also the wild cards and and before you realize basically you race back to back all the weekends from March all the way to September. That's a lot of stress and a lot of intensity. And it can actually take you away from, from your main goal of winning a championship or doing well on a championship. So in my opinion, and that's all in just my opinion, is is better to if you want to do do a couple of them just to just to prepare yourself, you know, mentally and physically, you know, for the racing season but really trying to stay focused on what exactly is your main goal for the season and keep this mental mental and physical energy for what it really matters rather than basically pick pizza boats basically and then be, before you realize you first of all you increase the, the risk basically of injuring yourself yeah. the more racing the more the more the more risk yeah all right and second you you can actually burn out yourself really quickly and before you realize you, you just you know you're not going to be there mentally and physically to do that so that's that's what I want to mention as well. Just as a reminder. <laughs> I, I, I listen, yeah. Yanis. I think that point of increased injury risk is a really, really, really valid point. Carlton, you know, I mean, your, your training regime. Um, what what do you think? Racing through the winter or, or, or not? Yeah, I I don't think racing a lot in the winter, and um, it definitely helps the odd race because you like you say you come to the first round and everyone's a bit crazy. Like I, I've done it myself in the past, um, but I've also done it myself in the past like i've done too much in the winter and i come to the first round and i'm almost like i'm almost like i've peaked in the winter you know what i mean yeah I've, I'm, I've overdone it i've done that in the past as well so yeah i um this time around i've like kind of trained a bit more smart to be honest th this year and yeah i i, I do want to do a couple of i, I want to try and get a race i've done i think two races now dunbar like a, a sand race and yeah. I would like to try and get another race in just, just before this our season starts. But yeah, not nothing too crazy really. I think on this, if you if you always look to like elite sport and you look at the factory guys, they do very little racing through the winter, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's technique, it's training, it's lots of cycling. 
and then they do La Chapelle or they do the Italian Championship yeah, yeah, or they do Matt yeah. Hawkstone. Yeah. You know, so they do four or five races or three or four races to get race yeah. ready. But the winter yeah. season is really about preparation, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But great, great question. So, um, Kay, I think you've got a fan in the audience, Andy Gardner. <laughs> can you see those questions on your screen? Or not? Can you not see yeah, yeah, you can see them. So body scanning is an amazing tool used in uh, in meditation, yoga, and an epic visual use of your mind to prepare and recovery. Great work. And, and the advice, thank you, Kay. Um, so I'm going to come on to something slightly different now. Um, I have got lots of questions coming in from the audience, by the way, which is fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, we, we talked about getting ready for the season. The season's quite quite different this year for the 65 riders, again, for a lot of our younger riders, especially if they're going to be doing the British Championship. So we talked about getting ready, that big sort of build-up, you know, what we need to do. They're going to come in 12th and 13th of March at Cullum. They're going to have to peak. It's going to be, whoa, you know, bang, go. And then they're not going to race again until June. So how, how do they manage that? One from a, a, a mental perspective, um, but also, again, from, a, you know, keeping themselves physically fit and, and, you know, when they get back in June, being ready again. OK, perhaps let's let's, let's look at it from the, the sort of the mind side of things first. So um, they've probably got about two months, haven't they, in between. There's a few things. And I suppose this isn't just um, this isn't just for that example. It's for anyone who's got a break, because I'm, I'm sure there's going to be other people throughout the season where they have to take a break for whatever reason. Um so one of the things that um, I think is really, really helpful, and that most people have probably heard of before in a forum, is once you've, um, you know, you've done that first race, you've got the build up, you always have that like moment while you where it's up and then it comes back down again uh, because you've got over that initial adrenaline of doing your first race. Um, but one of the ways in which you can keep that alive and help from a brain training point of view is um, visualization. Um, and also continuing, I don't know, Yanis, you'd probably be, it'd be good to um, add to this as well, is continuing those two months in between, almost like you're still in pre-season, if, if that makes sense, so carry on your training as though you've gone back into a pre-season. Um, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so, because it's just that one-off, so I suppose you've got to then maintain it at that level. Um, mentally, though, when I say visualisation, something that um, I do with a lot of the athletes that I work with, and it really helps bring bear with me here because i'm going to try and explain it as simply as i can it it means you are racing in your mind so basically it's a form of visualization so in our, it's mostly in our bodies right we all we all represent things or we remember things in three ways so it's either visually so we're either quite visual so what i mean by that is when we recall memories we see pictures so, like, if you were, I'm not going to ask you to do this, right? Or you can if you want. Clo if you were to close your eyes, right? In fact, yeah, I'm going to ask you three to do it. Close your eyes. <laughs> Come on, do it. Close your eyes. So, close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to, I'm going to say a word in a moment. And when I say that word, I want you to tell me what happens, okay? Donald Trump. Okay, open your eyes. <laughs> So, Mark, what happened when I said that word, Donald Trump? Uh, I saw his Twitter feed. Okay, you saw his Twitter feed. Colton, what did you get? I just thought of an idiot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did, you ever, did you see an idiot or did you um, hear his Sorry? voice? Did you see? Yeah, like yeah, he, like he's blonde, horrible hair, and just okay. Yeah, and, and there idiot, we go. Yeah. Sorry, Claire. Um, I, if we've got any Trump fans, sorry about that, Carlton. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Janice, what did you get? Oh, honestly, um, you know that expression that he's he's done a couple of times where he's like like <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> that expression. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like okay. He's moving around like yeah. <laughs> So, like, I don't know if anyone else joined in then or not, but basically, when, when we kind of recall a memory or think about something, we have this thing in our brain called a representation system, and it works on, like, three channels. So we're either predominantly visual, so we see things, Carlton, so is her, and he probably, I don't know, it could have been 3D, HD, bright, you know, um, yeah. or something else. Um, Mark, you said scripture feed, and that could also suggest not only visual, but auditory, so because you've seen the words, 
So mm -hmm. some people, uh, they really connect with sound. So if you love music, for example, and the way you prepare for a race, you might listen to your music and that just gets you in the right state you might be more auditory um and then there's kinesthetic which is feelings so when we act you know when you get that gut feeling and some people get like knots in the stomach and they get really nervous and they feel it through the body that would suggest that somebody's predominantly kinesthetic so if you think about those three things when i'll come back to my point around mental rehearsal Mental rehearsal is so much more than just visual because not everybody's visual. So you might be familiar with the term visualization and might think, well, I've tried that, but it doesn't work for me. And, and actually mental rehearsal incorporates the three things. So one of the ways that you can get children, especially you know, if we're talking about 65 riders, um, get them to close their eyes and imagine themselves racing and what it feels like when they're on the bike. Uh, and the sound of the, of, the, of the crowd and of the bike and the smell of a two-stroke, if you're on a two-stroke. So <laughs> if there's two strokes around them, um, whatever it is, the burger van, you know. So you can really experience um, racing even in then two months between the first race and the next race. And just like continuing with your physical fitness, it's just keeping that race feeling alive in their brain. The other thing to mention about that, though, because they are connected, this body scan and mental rehearsal, is the way our brain works is it doesn't know the difference between things that we've really done and things that we think we've done. So we have the power. Do you know, we're creative, right? You could create an image in your mind that you've never seen. Is that fair enough to say? Like you could, you know, if I said think, think of a pink elephant, can you see a pink elephant? Yeah. yeah. You've never seen a pink elephant, but you've created a pink elephant. Our brains are incredible. And so because of that, we can use what we know about how our brain works neurologically, and we can put it all together, and we can create an experience. So um, the best time to do that is either after you've done a body scan, because your body's nice and relaxed, so you're in this really deep, relaxed state anyway as part of your nervous system training that we talked about earlier on, or when you're just about to fall asleep. So when you're um, when you're dropping off to sleep is a really good time to do it as well. So if there's any parents listening and they've got those children doing the 65 races, um, you know, either having a recording or teaching them to do this at bedtime is really powerful. And the reason for that, just finally, just so you understand why am I saying to do it during body scan or sleep, is because when you're awake, just imagine you're on a, in a lift and you're on floor 10 and you're wide awake. So that's when you're in high alert. That's like, you know, cortisol, you know, high alert. You're really high alert. And as you're dropping into sleep, the lift is coming down, down, down. And zero, you're actually fast asleep. But when you get onto about level five, it's where your it's the call neural pathways in your brain. And just imagine it like a motorway with no cars on. We all like that, because we can go as fast as you like. No, you can't, you can't go as fast as you like. You, you go 70 miles an hour. Um, but you go along the motorway and there's free, you've no traffic, and your brain is just like that. So if you're doing this mental rehearsal at a point where your brain is on this clear motorway, it's like downloading this information directly into your subconscious brain. And that's the part of your brain that creates habits, behaviors. It looks after your immune system. Do you know when you kind of, you go into flow and you just think, I don't even know how I, how I did that. I just did it really well. That That's that's coming from your subconscious brain. So has any, has, has, have any of you ever driven anywhere and then got there and thought, how did I get there? Yeah, yeah, pretty much every day. <laughs> yeah, Wednesday. <laughs> you, arrive, <laughs> you, you drive for hours and you arrive there and kind of work up. Um, so, yeah, so doing this mental rehearsal, either after a body scan, but when you're about to fall asleep, it's like magic. It's amazing. These kids are going to be fine. Like, if, if you can teach your children how to mental rehearse well, or you can you know work with a coach to do it, then um, it's almost like they don't need to make any effort. And of course, it's not just for 65 riders, that's for all riders. And, and yeah, we're not waking you back up. Sorry, you know, like if you're sorry, 
But you know, once you're at that level five and you you start to think about the race, will it not waking you back up, like get all excited and stuff like that? Yeah, it's you know a really I mean? good, it's a really good point. Um, it depends on what you're you're doing within your mental rehearsal. Uh, it wouldn't wake you back up, no. So you would you'd be listening to it low while your body's in a really relaxed state. Mm. Um, I suppose it depends how excited you get, Carlton. It depends if you've yeah. hold back. If you hold that, <laughs> then yeah, yeah, you know, no, in all seriousness, then um, no, it wouldn't. It would just drop. You would, yeah, totally it well. would just keep you dropping yeah. down. Yeah, yeah, you would just oh, keep so. down. So, um, question for the audience. I think it's, it's it's a really really good one. This, um, you know, a lot of gyms have age restrictions around. So it's from Leanne and Tony Butterworth. It says, Yanis, what things could the younger ones be doing whilst they're at home? As it's hard for some of them to get into the gym with age limits. So, yeah, That's a good question. So it's a great question, actually. Uh, yeah, so plenty, plenty of things they can do. It's uh, first of all, you can literally you can just buy a few bands, basically from Amazon, uh, different resistance um, levels, uh, and then plenty of body weight as well. And at this age, anyway, when I'm talking about 65s um, and autos, I, I wouldn't, as, as I do now with Harley, for example. Um, we, we don't touch any weights at the moment and we won't touch for quite a while. Uh, and the reason is, as, as, as we said basically off the records before, a lot of riders, they don't even know how to use their own body yet. They don't, they don't have enough coordination and they don't, they, they don't have special awareness of how to use the body. So this is the first thing that you can develop. So what you can do at home, uh, you can do plenty, like as long as we can monitor the technique basically of, 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 of the child, um, you can do press ups, you can do body weight squats, uh, you can do uh, air squats, you, 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 can, you can work on your mobility. Um, we, we offer programs basically for, for, this, for this age and we offer home-based programs. Um, it's really hard to explain you just now, you know, on the, on the, on the, on the live what, what to do because there's so many, so many different things, but what you can do, work on the body weight, body weight movements. Um, there are plenty of stuff you can find as well uh, online, like on, on YouTube, for example, if you, if you want to. Um, but yeah, the, the the way you should think, if, if we're talking about the parents to the from the parents to the child, basically, what, the way you should think is you want to train compound movements. Compound movements is basically when you're working your whole body, so a lot of, a lot of different muscles at the same time. So. Um, Think how the rider is on the bike. So if, if you think about the analysis of the sport, you, you want to basically make sure you have a strong chest so you can absorb impacts when you get, you know, on the handlebars. You really need strong posterior chain. So basically your back, your glutes, your hamstrings. So you can do glute bridges. You can do uh, WYT, for example, for your back, to strengthen your back, which is all body weight movement. Um, you can use bands. And you can do like rows with the bands basically and just put the band around, you know, like the stairs, the staircase or from the door. You can buy TRX straps. So you can do a lot of body weight movements that way as well. Plenty of stuff, <laughs> really. No, I think, I think you're yeah. right. I mean, you know, in the nicest possible way, YouTube is fantastic. Carl, it's just a quick question for you. Now, yeah. I, know, I know you know Jordan Pickford really well. And, you yeah. know, I, I, I'm sure he is super, super fit, right? When, when we when we created the foundation, we asked people what their routines were. A lot of people, you know, they go, I go boxing, I, I do, you know, I do football, I do this, I do it. I guarantee if you put Jordan Pickford on your bike and asked him to do a 30-minute motor around Cusses, halfway through, he, he, he'd be blowing out of his backside, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, like, you know, if, you played, if you played half an hour forever, my point being is you can still be very fit, but you have to yeah. train for the sport that you're doing, right? Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, Yanis, I can't find the question, I'm, I'm, and I apologise to whoever sent this in. Um, but one of the questions from the audience is: How can they increase or improve their flexibility? Just by doing flexibility. What might that look yeah. like? So, um, first of all, they need to understand this. You we have the static flexibility, which basically you can increase generally. Uh, you know, your, your the range of motion um of, of of the muscle the tendon and then we have also um the dynamic uh stretching of flexibility which is more about preparing the body for the task that you're going to do so um again it's 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 great question but it, it, it demands quite a specific answer which is hard to just say you know like verbally 
but the best way to do it is you you want to you want to increase overall your flexibility if you have really flexible like flexible shoulders um which is basically part of your chest as well and then you, you should have quite flexible um spine as well um so you be able to rotate properly hips as well your hips have to be very 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 flexible and of course the hamstrings adductors uh, which the adductors is, is very important. How many times you've been on the corner, you lose the front end, and the first thing you do, you're going for a split. So, and, and then you pull your adductors, for, for example. Um, that's one, that's very common thing that happens. Uh, hamstring as well. <laughs> Again, when you're going to split, the first thing you pull is your hamstring as well. So, this is the thing. So, if, if it's the first thing you need to ask yourself is like, what do I need to improve? The second thing is, how can I improve it? And then, by how you can just Google it and you will find plenty of answers that are there. Now, make sure you're not over complicated, it's, it, just keep it simple. Uh, for the stretching, it's good to keep, when we're trying to improve the overall flexibility, you want to keep it minimum 20 seconds uh, per exercise, whatever you're doing basically, in order to give time to your brain and your body to adapt and adjust basically and go through, through the range. And you can do as many times as you want to. But when you're doing static stretching, don't do static stretching and then trying to go to train in the gym or on the bike because you actually increase the possibility of injuring yourself. Static stretching is to relax the muscles and improve the flexibility. Dynamic stretching is to prepare the, the body. That's what we're trying to do. Oh, brilliant. Thank you for that. And that, that links Anyways. in really nicely to, and this is a really, really common question. And we, we got asked yeah. this on Instagram as well. And, and, uh, Junior Morrison's asked this, what is the best warm-up before a race? And I think mm. we, we need to look at both physical and mental for that as well, please. Carlton, what's what's your pre-race routine? What's your, what's your pre-race warm-up? Yeah, so we, we well, Yanis is at most of the races, but we, we always do a, a, bit of a bit of a run or a cycle, you know, just get the heart rate up a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, good, good stretch off. Like a squat, like the squat and things like that. Like get the get all the muscles, get all the muscles working. And also recently we've been doing quite a lot of stuff with like a reaction, like with balls and things like that. Just get the mind switched on, and it's great. Like it just gets you gets you so up for it. And yeah, and that all all for me as well. I always try and listen to some music. Just get you get you up for the race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw James Barker juggling and, and things like <laughs> yeah. that. Is that, is that yeah, part yeah. of what you I mean? It's, it's great hand-to-eye coordination, right? It's brilliant yeah, yeah, hand-to-eye coordination. Yeah. And like you say, getting yourself switched on. Kay, a motocross rider. They're gonna they're gonna go to um, they're gonna go to Park Ferme, do a parade lap, maybe come come back in. Um, you know, their heart rate <clears> is, is gonna be up. Then they're gonna go to the line and their heart rate is gonna be going through the roof. And they're going to then have 25 minutes of absolute sheer intensity. How do they mentally prepare for that? So, um, so again, there's, there's, there's a few things. And again, I know I've said it already, but there's some, because different people process yeah. things in different ways, it is different for different people. So there's a whole range of things that, that would work for one and not for another. Um, so one of them we've just mentioned, actually, so... It, in in psychology, we, we we would call them high performance games. So the um, so my practice is neuro linguistics. So we look at how the, the the brain responds to different things, and there's lots of different things you can do to get yourself into a high performance mode. So we call them high performance state games. And a couple of them you've just mentioned. Um, so juggling is a really, really good thing to do before you go to that line, um, before you go out there. Now, the reason for that is hand and eye coordination is great. So that's one purpose for it. But in terms of mind management, the actual, um, the reason we do something like uh, the tennis ball games or the dropping or the juggling is for a completely different reason. And it's to activate all your senses now, one of the reasons that your heart rate starts pumping to the level that it does, again, I told you there'll be links all the way through this evening, is cortisol. You know, again, it's cortisol. When there's too much cortisol, that stress hormone pumping through your body, a little bit of it is enough to keep you safe and to keep you um, in pre, what we call pre-race jitters. 
so that you are ready and primed for the event, um, but you're not in performance anxiety. So these ball games that we're talking about, what they do is they keep your focus and your attention um, in that moment so that you can't time travel. So basically, it's anxiety. So so, so, the, so the, the, the cortisol is being produced and it's going into what's called the fear center in your brain. It's called the hippocampus. So when it's going into this fear center, when it's pumping too much, um, it could affect your performance. And that's why people get things like stage fright, for example, or they say, you know, I couldn't, the gate drop, but I just didn't move fast enough and, and things like that. So those games, what they're doing is they're bringing all your attention back into the moment so that you can't time travel because that anxiety can only exist in the past or in the future. So if your brain is like fully in the moment, it can't do that. So what it does, because it's activating all those different senses, it, it forces your brain into a high performance state. So there's there's lots of different things. You can use the ball games, which is like juggling, for example. <laughs> You can use um, anything that activates the senses. So um, the, this might sound strange, but singing to yourself will keep yourself keep you nice and calm, or humming as well. Um, that that is a really good thing to do. So singing and humming um, that will keep you nice and calm. And the other thing, which again it will sound super simple, but we can't underestimate it, is remembering how to breathe. hundred percent. You know, it's getting that oxygen to the brain, right? It had to be seen. Yeah, because when we get stressed or when, when we, we we hold our breath, it's the same in the gym, Yannis, right? Because when people are like pushing, like trying to, and they hold the breath, uh, and then the oxygen starts going to the brain. So we use something called box breathing, it's like a four by four technique. So, as you know, so imagine you know, the riders going to the gate, the intensity is starting to build, they've done the game, so they're in a better state than they would have been. They're high performance get, um, states. Um, but it's just literally before, hold, before, breathe out for four. And do that about four yeah. or five times. And it's just enough to re regulate the oxygen to your brain and reduce the cortisol. Um, one final thing I just want to add to that is one of the ways you can activate that more quickly is I know everyone's going to go off and do attention training now and body scans and go and find out what apps they've got so that they can go Google it and, and download these apps to do it. If you use something like a scent, so say you add like a, you know, like essential oils, like a scent, um, or it could be an aftershave, for example, a particular aftershave, uh, if you're a guy or a perfume, if you're a girl, you could put that on while you're doing the body scanning so you're training your body to uh, relax, basically. And um, basically, you can put it in, and, and a lot of riders do do this, will put the scent inside the helmet. So when the helmet goes on, the smell will activate the mind-body connection, and it's, again, like magic. You take that breath in, and it sends a signal to the brain, says, right, now it's time to relax, calm, get ready. And you go into performance mode. And, and I know saying it in words might sound, how will that work? So if you don't believe me, go do it. And then you'll see and feel how it works. And then you can let me know how fantastic it was because it does work. Because our, our mind and body connection is so incredibly strong and we don't always take advantage of it. So yeah, really simple things you can do. Breath, um, the ball games, the scent. Um, it all creates a much stronger connection to keep yourself nice and um nice and calm uh, or as calm as you calm you're not going into performance anxiety basically so calm enough to be able to perform and focus brilliant that's a really interesting answer thank you for that um time for one more question because i know carlton's got to go for his supper and eat so um <laughs> i was gonna ask you uh, have you had tea yet carlton no, you yeah i'm starving he oh, was WhatsApp and I said, I'm not just going to go on for. <laughs> so, yeah, last yeah. question then uh, from Tracy McClure. Uh, she asked, my son is 11 and rides a, an 85 small wheel. How many times a week should he be training in the gym to pick up strength and fitness? Uh, now, I know you don't know where he is at the moment in terms of his physical fitness and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. But roughly sort of three times a week, maybe. Yeah, so the the average, I would say, at uh, this age, at uh, this stage, in generally, uh, between 
I would say upper body, one, one's upper body, one's lower body, and about two, three times a week uh, on the actual cardiovascular fitness as well. And and they can he can do, for example, upper body, and then straight after the upper body, he can also do about an hour, if he has the time, an hour of uh, cardiovascular training. So, for example, like uh, rowing, cycling, skiing, um, in a low intensity, like zone two intensity, very low intensity. And, and then this this thing about three times a, a week, alongside with one upper body and one lower body session. That's the that's that, that actually could work really well for anyone, not not just for eleven years old. Brilliant. Um, listen, I want to say thank you. Oh, I have got one more question that came in from yes. Instagram for you, Carlton, especially for you. <laughs> um, it's from a Lucy Barker, <laughs> and she asked. Who is your favourite person to coach? <laughs> yeah, it's got to be Lucy, hasn't it? She's she's unreal. Like she is one of the best out there. And honestly, some of the boys this year are going to get a shot. She's uh, she's absolutely flying at the minute. So you all better watch out. <laughs> no, I, I I couldn't agree more. She's she's a fantastic girl. She's been amazing for us. Um, yeah, so good. So just just to summarise, firstly, you know, when you guys agreed to do this, you know, thank you very, very much. Um, no, thank you. I think the audience need to understand that you guys work with people on an individual basis. We are trying to do a kind of one-stop shop fits all here. What we're trying to do in these workshops is to give an overview. So what I'm going to ask you, Kay, is if people want to get in touch with you, get more details about what you've talked about tonight, where do they get hold of you? Um, Instagram is probably the best place, Gritty People Athletes. There are two Instagrams, one's Gritty People and one's Gritty People Athletes. So it's definitely the latter, the second one. Um, and, and also, I just want to add to that. Like For me, I'm really passionate about helping athletes um, understand their mindset. I don't, like you, Mark, I don't think we understand enough. I don't think it's discussed enough um, in the sport. And so um, if it's just a question, you know, throw it out i'm really happy to answer it because the more awareness we've got about how our mind can help us um lucy's happy with you now carlson i think it was the right yeah. <laughs> i think you got that one right well done off air lucy you said james but i won't drop him in no i never james. no i never <laughs> Um, sorry, Kay. Sorry, Kay. We, no, 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 sorry. Guys, I, I think it's brilliant. Um, yeah. So just, yeah, just even if it's just a general question, please do ask me because I do think there's, I think there's a lot of work to do in the motocross industry around helping athletes understand there is another way to enjoy your racing, and ultimately that's what this is about. It's about having fun on race day and having um, a good experience. So yeah. So get in touch if you've got any questions. Brilliant. Yanis, the same for you. I know you. I know you're working with one of our riders, Young Harley. I've seen him up jumping around with you and <laughs> doing all doing all sorts of things. So, where where can people get in touch with you if they want more information on what you provide? Yeah, uh, obviously, I'm very active with the social media nowadays. Uh, the either Facebook or on Instagram. Feel free to uh, you know to send me a message. I normally I reply within a day or so. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, yeah. Just, just get in touch with anything you need to. Even if it's a simple question, more than happy to answer and help you. And yeah. Carlton, I know you. I know you're doing yeah. coaching. So if people want to want to follow, yeah, you on Instagram or want yeah, coaching, Instagram, Carlton underscore husband. Um, just anything at all on and off the bike. I'm, I'm happy to help anybody. Uh, just give me a message. Brilliant. Well, look, the the panel all very kindly given their time for free. The foundation is it. It relies on donations. I put a little banner up earlier. If you've enjoyed tonight. Go over to the website, donate a tenner. It will go back into motocross, I promise you. Um, every pound we raise, 80p goes to motocross, 20p goes to the air ambulance. Our next show, which will be on Tuesday, and I'm delighted Kay's going to be joining me again. I've got Tom Grimshaw and Nick Carby, and, and we're going to be talking about sleep um, and the importance of sleep because, quite frankly, if you don't get enough sleep, you won't perform. Um, Kay, thank you. Carlton, thank you. Yanis, thank you. To everyone that's watched, I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll see you all on Tuesday night. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank Cheers. You. Good night. Cheers. Bye.